So I want to talk today about excelling in the grace of giving. I really love this subject. I look forward to it, uh, not because I want more of your money uh, or because I think it will somehow uh, help uh, the church or our cause. Uh, th this is maybe indirectly, but what I'm most happy about is I'm just reviewing and thinking about my own lifestyle in this and how God's been so good to me and been through the fire of testing these out and the things I'm going to tell to you, I've lived out to the dregs, to the very bottom, to the very nth degree in my walk with the Lord. I'm just thinking in my brain as I'm looking at Janice, there are all the crazy adventures we've been on, you know, I'm just thinking of when we bought our first furniture when we first married and then trying to make a decision about paying for that furniture and how it just was most, but the almost overwhelming thing I ever thought. We bought that crazy couch and I, it was... It was beautiful, but for me, it was like that couch was my enemy. It was horrible. I had to come up with this payment, you know, every month, and I thought, oh, my gosh, we overextended. Then I'm confronted with, do I keep giving or not? Oh, boy. And I just chose to keep giving my time no matter what. And, boy, I tell you, I stretched every minute. That was just the beginning of many, many times. I'm thinking of our time in we planted the church in Hawaii, and, and we didn't have enough money to buy a couch or anything. We just slept on the floor, and she was pregnant. And, and, you know, and we just needed about everything because we only had two couples we knew on the whole island, and there we were to do this church. And I remember sleeping on the floor, and, and when that tithe time came up, that giving time came, oh, man, oh, man. And then I'm the pastor, right, and it's challenging everything I got, you know. <laughs> to make room, and I just realized, and there's just so many other experiences like that. Um, so I'm coming from a vantage point of both strength and weakness, strength uh, now these days more because, you know, of where the Lord's taken us financially, but every step along the way, making these decisions to be uh, excel in the grace of giving. So I want to read a couple of passages to you, and um, when I'm speaking this sermon, I, I, I feel myself on the inside lit up like a light bulb. I feel smiley happy because I'm, I think I'm telling you something so useful, so practical in your life and also at the same time so supernatural that, that you have, you'll have tremendous hope all your days if you grab a hold of these passages that I'm sharing. Now, all scriptures like that, but these, I say, especially in an area that's pressed all the time and people driving long distances up and down the freeway and trying to make house payments and everything, it's especially for you because I just think it's so important that you and your finances break through into a place of prosperity and grace both with your time and with your money. And I believe it's absolutely possible and absolutely uh, God's will for you to be in that place. We have a saying here, around here, and it's not because we're all lazy and laying around. I don't know very many lazy people who live in Orange County, frankly. But let's just put it this way. I just like to put it this way. Less work and more money. In other words, if you're going to work, which many of you do work many, many hours, then let's just get a high return for our labor. Okay? And I just think that's God's will for all of us. So we can say it another way. Now, I just saw about half of you wake up. Oh, now you're talking. This is what I want. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I'm talking. Well, let's tell me more. Okay, I'll tell you more. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8, uh, verse, or, excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7. But since you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge and complete earnestness and in the love we have kindled in you, See that you also excel in this grace of giving. Notice he didn't say, see that you excel in this giving. He said this grace of giving. So grace implies two things. First, that God gives grace to do this. And second of all, that God gives grace after you do this. That's important, really important. No matter who you are and where you're at, I guess got to really emphasize that as well. And also, I want to just look at Proverbs chapter 11 because it emphasizes something that I I think that is very much in the heart of God and very much really what we're after in this sermon today. We're going to read verses 24 and 25. One person gives freely yet gains more. Another withholds unduly but comes to poverty. Verse 25, a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. So what we're really talking about is we're talking about a generous person, a person who's generous. And as we're going to discover, there are many ways to be generous, not only with our money, but also with our time, our energy. There's all kinds of ways to sow. We're going to talk a lot about sowing and reaping, but sowing and reaping covers a lot of categories. Now, first thing you see on your outline, Roman number one, God is first and foremost, giving is first and foremost a matter of the heart. This is really critical. It's a matter of the heart. So God is the ultimate giver. God has giving in his character. In his very heart. It's part of who he is. 
For God so loved the world that he gave. So if you want to walk with God, you're going to have to walk with a giver. And if you want to be discipled by God, he's going to disciple you as a giver because that's what he does. But it's interesting. If we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, we're going to be in some of those verses in 2 Corinthians a lot this morning. But I want to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And let's just look at verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. So God, in his heart, is a giver. Jesus is a giver. He gave. Even though it says here, he had to become poor for our sake. And God's a giver. He's the ultimate giver, really. And God began this whole plan of redemption with a giver. How did he begin the plan of redemption? Well, he had this guy. His name was Abraham. Remember him? And the world, interestingly enough, even in this day, is still reeling from the effects of God's covenant with Abraham. <laughs> Israel finds its way right in the news all the time. And us descendants of Israel and of the Jews, even if we might not be Jews in ethnicity, we are Jews in inheritance. Because all of these promises and the plan of God, the redemptive plan of God came through Abraham and then into the Old Testament people and then as they developed and into finally the church. And then, okay, most of the people of early evangelists and things that were leaders in the church, they were all Jews. And we have this incredible inheritance. But it started with one who started the whole Jewish thing going on. His name was Abraham, but Abraham was a giver. You wonder why he selected Abraham. Well, he was a guy like God. He had a heart after God. His name was Abraham, and God called him his friend. And let's just read why God called him his friend. James 2, 21 to 23. Was not our father, interesting, he calls Abraham our father, Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. How many want to be God's friend? I want to be God's friend. Well, you better be careful how you raise that hand. You can just imagine the things that were going through Abraham's brain, and most of us know this story, but God said, okay, I'm going to walk with you. You're going to be my friend. We're going to walk together. We're going to cause this amazing thing to happen. But then along the way, he said, you know what? I'd like you to sacrifice your only son to me. It was interestingly on Mount Moriah where the present temple is. It's that whole thing, right? The Jewish temple. So I'm going to, I want you just to set that son aside. I want, I want you to. So he followed through all the way. We know in Hebrews what he was thinking. He had so much faith at that point that he, realized, he, he was thinking, well, even if I kill him, God will raise him from the dead. That's what he was thinking in his mind. But nevertheless, he did not withhold the most precious thing in the universe. It's very interesting that God would take a person like that that would do that, and he became his friend and covenant forever, and all these generations are blessed because of what he did, including us down today, because God paired with a, uh, a giver. God's a giver, and Abraham was a giver. And God's not just a giver. The interesting thing about that, because sometimes this whole process of giving can be a very sullen thing, you know, <laughs> like paying your taxes or paying your debts or, you know, paying your bills. It's not like that at all because God's not just a giver. He's a cheerful giver. Hebrews 12, 2 says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Think about that for a moment. He not only endured the cross, but there was a joy. Why? Because he could see on the other side of what his gift was going to do. He could see it. So obviously nobody wants to go to the cross and suffer that way, but his joy, there was a joy, there was something in his heart. And that same joy is what I experience when I give these days. I just know, on the other side, I've been through so many things, I just know, man, this, this isn't a big, this is a privilege. Man, I'll tell you what, and, and if something bumps me out of that or whatever, I feel very, very uncomfortable. I never feel uncomfortable about my finances until something bumps my tithing or if I delay it for a week or something. I just feel uncomfortable that entire week, you know, sometimes juggling everything, but I manage to get it done. And when I do, I ha, ah, beautiful. That's awesome. Because I know what God has in mind for us. And also, when I give, it's just such an, a nice experience because I look back on a whole lifetime. You know, I have a few gray hair now, but you know, just one or two. <laughs> but I'm looking back at my life, and I'm thinking, my goodness, all through these years, God's prospered me and helped me 
And I've been through some crazy stuff. And all along the way, God's been so faithful to me. And so for me, it's a joy. It's such joy. So look at verse 6 of 2 Corinthians chapter 9 on this thing of, of cheerfulness. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Why does God love a cheerful giver? Because he's a cheerful giver. So he wants you to, not only to give, but to experience the cheerfulness and the joy that comes from being a giver. That's why Acts chapter 20, verse 35 says it's more blessed to give than to receive. Well, it's for two reasons. One, you can never outgive God, which we'll get to in a moment. But the second thing is that God's a happy giver. And when you do this and you make a lifestyle and you become generous, according to your standards even, when you know that you're stepping out there in that place of weakness, when you do that, you know, God, there's, there's an amazing place in Acts chapter 21, 35. He's more blessed to give than to receive because eventually you get caught up in the emotions of it and you begin to realize, my, my. Nothing can defeat me. God helps me. God's with me, and I'm with God. And so when we give these acts, of, it becomes truly a worship experience when we begin to give, right? As you learn to give, you share the cheerfulness and happiness of God. I, I just want to emphasize this a lot. And uh, as you move along and you get more and more experience and you see more things, you, you, you become, uh, there's a cheerfulness about your giving, whatever area it is in, because you realize, wow, I'm sowing this, but the Lord's blessing me too. And then you just go, well, that becomes a matter of fact in your experience so much that then you just enjoy just blessing people. Just a nice thing to do. Not everybody enjoys blessing people on the same level. Some people have an unusual gift of giving, so they're really crazy. I mean, they really are, uh, you know, involved with the emotions of God like this and stuff, and it's just part of who they are. But all of us have this wonderful grace that we can enter into. So I want to look at... Um, uh, second, uh, uh, Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30 for a moment. And so many of you know this, uh, these parables, the parable of the talents of gold. I, I can't ever get used to saying that. It's the power, uh, I mean, because uh, I learned another version, but that's what my Bible says, the parable of the talents of gold. In other words, we're talking about money. And so I want to just read a few verses from here, and I want you to notice something about this cheerfulness and happiness of God. So Matthew chapter 25, again, it'll be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. So then the story goes on to say that the guy with the five bags, he takes those bags and he makes five more. And then the guy with two makes two more, but the one with one, he didn't give his money. So investing is giving. He didn't invest his money. So interesting as you look at these verses uh, and you look what happens as, as uh, the, the master is dealing with each of these guys who uh, had an investment to make with the Lord. I want to just read verse 19. So after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I've gained five more. Now look what his master replies. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Now look at this. Here's the thing. Come and share your master's happiness. It's, it's not just uh, about this uh, well done and good and faithful servant. He also says, come and share your master's happiness. So he does the same thing with the guy with two that makes two more. And the end of it is, come and share your master's happiness. And this is very, very significant because giving has that dimension to it. And I, I love those verses. And of course, the guy that gave one, look what he says about him. He says, you wicked, lazy servant. You, you, you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers because he just took the money and hid it and then gave it back to his master at another time. So that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Then he has the audacity to say, take that one bag of gold from that guy and give it to the one that's got five and made five more. <laughs> Sometimes you look at this and go, I don't get it. Yeah, because his ways aren't our ways. I mean, it just seems backwards. Why would he do that? You know, it seems like the guy that did the one bag did pretty good. No, but you're misunderstanding. 
Giving is part of the whole deal. And the faster you realize it, the better off you're going to be. If you want to follow Jesus, generosity is the thing. Take it from the generous person, the most generous person in the universe, a father who sent his son and a son who became poor to die for you so that you could be wealthy, so that you could live forever. And not only live forever, it seems like such a faraway thing, but live in happiness, joy, live and also financial prosperity and do well. You're meant to do well. Now you can look around at every other people, you know, and get amazing exaggerated versions of this, but I'm just saying you have enough money, you're prospering. I don't mean that you get rich, or now we're talking about giving to get rich. I'm just saying that there's a will of God here that has to do with your emotions and your insides, where you're prospering on the inside and the outside, and this thing of money is not a problem. As a matter of fact, money becomes for you a joy. Paul describes the corporate joy of God's people sharing with one another in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 12 to 15. And so what's happening here in the background of this story is that Paul is saying, hey guys, you Corinthians, would you, could you help uh, the, the people that are struggling in Jerusalem? They, they need your help. And he was just gathering an offering on all the places he would go amongst the Gentile churches. He was gathering an offering to, to bless them. And um, so this is the background of the story. So it's really basically one church raising enough money to help another church. The one in Corinth helping the one in Jerusalem. So let's read these uh, verses from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 12 to 15. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. In other words, when this gift's given, everybody's happy. <laughs> the guys that are giving it are happy, and they're happy to see... These people that are suffering on the other end happy. And I've been on both sides of that equation many, many times, and not just in this country, but in many countries of the world. And it's just an amazing thing. Just to be able to bless people and to see the gospel move forward and to see things open up and to see things happen and children taken care of and the whole thing. You know, and I, I just think of so many things, so many pictures are going through my mind of so many places I've been. And one of the most dramatic is just... Uh, Walking into India, uh, we have this place where we have a, a large number of children that we just take off the streets, otherwise they'd be left to die. And we take them when nobody else wants them. And just being in there and watching this whole group of people sacrificing seven, eight hours a day just to take, take care of these babies. And then we find places for them to adopt in other countries even. We've begun to do that. We've pioneered it in India. And it's just an amazing thing to go in there and generosity is height, you know, the amazing amount of money it takes to do that uh, there in that one little room, or maybe those, uh, actually it's more than one room, it's a big house, it's got a couple of houses now. And we're building a, a, a place in Hyderabad for them now, but it's like generosity concentrated, you know, and then when you get into a place where generosity is concentrated, there's this overflowing and many thanksgivings, expressions of thanks to God. It's an amazing place. And just notice here, <clears throat> if you look at verses 12 to 15, and in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. we got a lot of Indians praying for us and other nationalities praying for us here because of the ministry we've been doing. But this prayers for you, their, th their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. So you've got this dynamic going. And I just this is what I love the most even about prayer meetings. So much about this. Uh, man, I tell you, when you're in a prayer meeting and you actually know enough about each other to know their needs, you know, and you're going back and forth, just... Everybody give th gives thanks when you break through. Yeah. And when they break through, you give thanks. And there's this passing of joy back and forth. And sometimes there may be even giving in that small group, but it's a joyous thing. And we're seeing this joyous thing happening where these guys are supplying the needs of, of the ones in Jerusalem. The ones in Jerusalem are so thankful, and they're praying back the blessing back on the original people in Corinth and just going back and forth. And this, I tell you, is heaven on earth. That's why we gather in small groups and larger groups. And the great thing about a smaller group or maybe an association or something, we just sort of get to have this overflow of thanksgiving back and forth. There's a joy exchange with others in the body of Christ that comes with giving money, love, acts of service, or kindness to one another. That's part of the whole deal. That's why it's so important to be more than just casually joined. You don't go to a church meeting. Oh, my gosh, if that's all you do, how horrible. Because you're giving up really valuable Sunday sleep time and everything else. If that's all you do, my, the body of Christ is so much more profound than that and happy than that. 
Joyful in that. Find a place. Make friends. Find friends. Make relationships. Be a part. Whatever we do, wherever we're going, just be a part of the whole thing because there's a joy exchange there. Acts of money, love, acts of service. Man, I think it's one of the most amazing things in the body of Christ. And people supply needs for other people. They don't even know other things. People hear about it. It's just generosity in a, a, a generous church. I'll tell you, the reward of a generous church is God's joyful presence. And I'm just praying to God that we'll be more and more of a generous church. I think we are, honestly. That's why you feel the joyful presence of God when we worship. Did you feel that this morning? That's coming from somewhere else. Not just because, oh, man, he played the right song. It's more than that. It's not just the right song, although I don't want to have crummy songs or crummy musicians, right? But it's more than that. It's the expression of the church and the joy that's going back and forth, you know, one to another. You know, I, I'm just, uh, I got overwhelmed this, this whole Christmas season. I So, Sometimes right around New Year's, you know, it's everybody's traveling and everything. We get a little short on labor, you know, and I can't remember if it was the day before Christmas. I think it was, I mean, day before New Year's. Um, so I drove by there and I noticed, man, <laughs> they were struggling under the weight of this avalanche of giving that was going, you know. So I just got out there and I just started helping them for a couple of hours, you know. And I like to do this from time to time. One of my most pleasant experiences is being out where those bins are and all the stuff's collecting. Because here's what's happening. The people are coming and they're giving, and, they, and most of them know what they're giving to. They're not just giving to a thrift store, but they're giving because we're feeding people. They're giving because they know what we do with people. And we do a myriad of things, including homeless ministry, all kinds of things from the proceeds of the warehouse. So they know. So they're giving their stuff, and they come with this sort of, they're not just dropping off stuff and leaving. Many of them are coming, and they got this joy in them. You can tell. It's like they just want somebody on the other end to share the joy with them because they know they're doing something great, and they're really happy about it. So when I see them coming, I can feel that on them. And so I'm receiving and helping them with it. And as I'm helping them with it, there's this joy exchange. We're all happy. And matter of fact, there's a joy that sometimes gets drowned out by weird people and hard things. And, but for the most part, in the warehouse, the way we work hard and we do all this, there's a joy that goes through there that is unmistakable. No matter how big the load is, no matter how hard it is, it's just a joy that is unmistakable in the room. It's the joy exchange. It's this generosity that's going out, and with it comes the cheerful heart of God. And I was there uh, on that day, and I was having such a great time. I mean, I was just a couple hours, just, and I, I was just enjoying. I could feel the enjoyment of the Lord. I could feel the pleasure of the Lord. I could feel the happiness of the people and uh, all of us. And, oh, my, this is heaven on earth. But it comes through generosity. It comes the way you wouldn't expect. It comes through, make, it could be even through dirty work or hard or whatever, but if it's oriented right and in worship to the Lord, generosity and the cheerful heart go together. Oh, my, giving is first and foremost a matter of the heart. So if you look at Romans 2, there's an order to giving. So first, a seed sown weakness and then the multiplication of the seed for a harvest. See, givers are made. They, we, we learn to give. We, you know, just my grandkids, you know, I'm going through it all again, you know. They're not born generous. Now, some of the kids are more, some of my grandkids are more generous than others. I don't know how all that works. But for the most part, they're pretty darn selfish. So you just got to train that. You got to teach them. You don't have, you know what I mean? To learn to be generous and uh very territorial and all the rest. And you don't have to teach. They're just sort of born in there. So, so when we sow, we're like those kids. We, we sow in weakness. When we give something away, it, you know, it's, it's way against that natural man, but not against the supernatural man inside of us. But we sow in weakness, and then there's a multiplication of the seed for a harvest. That's the surprising thing. So you're giving something away, but you think, oh, my gosh, I'm losing. But actually, in God's economy, once the seed goes down, it comes up and bears a crop, and then you gain. It's the delayed gratification that does the sin. But as you begin to learn about delayed gratification, you realize that delayed gratification is pretty good. It just might take a time. God might take you through a few turns. But as you do it more and more, you just know that's part of the deal. I'm throwing my hook out. I'm going to get a fish. Some days that fish comes immediately, and some days it takes a little while. But there's always enough. And sometimes the fishing is really good. <laughs> We call that good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. So let's look at 2 Corinthians 9 again. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you have, should, should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So that's the seed that sowed in weakness. All right? 
So even Jesus had to deal with this weakness of sowing. So we read in John chapter 12, verses uh, 23 to 26. He says something very significant about his life, which went right over the heads of his disciples. The most generous person in the universe was about to give his life. But look at the wording of how, how he words this. John chapter 12, verse 23. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. So he's saying, for me to be any use to you, I've got to go on the ground. I have to die. I have to give first. And if I give first, I'll die. I'll be buried in that ground. But you know what? I'm going to come up out of the ground, and there's going to be a harvest. And pretty soon, there's going to, a whole bunch, there's going to be a whole bunch of me running around. We call them Christians. Christians are going to be running around everywhere <laughs> from this resurrection power. This sowing that I'm doing is going to bring forth a harvest. See, this is the law of sowing and reaping that we see all around nature. God put, bound it up in nature, forecasting the day when the Son of God would bury and be buried in the ground for a harvest. So you have to sow to get a harvest. Luke chapter 6, verses 37 and 38, one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible for several reasons, not all of which I'll mention now, but I love these verses. Do not judge and you'll not be judged. Do not condemn, and you'll not be condemned. Forgive, and you'll be forgiven. Notice the word give inside forgive. Forgiveness takes something out. It's not comfortable. It's weak. <laughs> to forgive somebody, especially if they've horribly wronged you, it's weak. It's like the seed sown. But give, and it'll be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured in your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Wow, that's incredibly significant. So our first steps of generosity start with honoring God and his cause with what the Bible calls the tithe. It's giving the first 10% of our income to God. Now the reason why, and I like to mention this uh, as the cause, because see, when we go to Malachi and we read those infamous scriptures, which actually have found... <laughs> I found actually torments people, keeps them awake at night because they don't see it because they haven't got it inside yet and they haven't experienced. So they, they try to give the first tenth of their income like for two weeks and then it just all falls apart and like the couch, they're worried about that, paying the payment for this and that. And, and so it's, you know, wow. And then they get discouraged. But don't be discouraged. It's an opportunity for you. So you passed on the opportunity this week, but I highly recommend for your own sake in your life and for the long span of your life. And I'm looking at you guys that are smiling at me right now because many of you have tested this and you know. You've got a secret. <laughs> and you're very, very, very well aware of all the weakness when you sowed that thing, what it felt like and what it feels like. Some of you are on one of those right now. You sowed some money and you haven't quite seen the return or God do it or you're in a difficult place, but you kept on going, right? But look what he says here. This is really important. Going back here. I don't know why I get off on these little tangents here. All right, so we're in Malachi, right? <clears throat> I want to read the rest of this. Malachi chapter 3. I, the Lord, do not change, so you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you've turned away from my decrees and not kept them. Return to me, and I'll return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet yeah, you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings, there's two things. Tithe means the tenth. Offerings means other giving beyond that. You're under a curse, your whole nation, because you're robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me, he says. Give it a shot. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. His intent is for you to be blessed. This is his intent. This is why I have no problem uh, uh, you know, saying less work, more money. Because if I just give what God, what's God, give God what's God's, you know, and let Him lead me in this whole thing. Guess what? See if I won't throw open the floodgates of heaven. So I'm all about the floodgates of heaven. 
I'm all about less work and more money. I'm about prospering and pour out so much blessing there will not be. I like that part. Pour out so much blessing there will not be enough room to, so, to store it. I'll prevent pests from destroying your crops. How many have that happen? So when you think you're just getting ahead in your bills and all of a sudden a water main breaks or some weird thing happens. Well, when that happens, it's going to happen to everybody. But sometimes I think I have a little extra insurance in there. But even when it happens, I don't worry about it. Okay, good. We'll fix it. No problem. I'm not going to overwhelm me. I, you know, I got some other economy working for me. Matter of fact, that's the only way I've kept my sanity for these 40 years of ministry. It's the only way I kept my sanity. Because, you know, I'm not investing in the stock market. I'm not doing this and this. Not. I just got another economy. And I tell my children that. One of my children just crossed over into this in a big way. And it's so great to watch God bless him. And he's walking around just in awe because he's just started doing this. And it's just painful, especially when you're young and married and everything, and you're just stepping into it. I'm so proud of him. And he's kind of proud of himself, but he's realizing, hmm, this is really working. He's beginning to see the momentum build. First, it was like death in the ground, right? Wow, woof, I'm missing that money, right? I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Test me. Give me a shot. Try me out. See what happens. All right? So here's the important thing about this. It's real important. So, like, is the pastor preaching this so he can get more money? We're a little low starting the year. No, we're not low. <laughs> I'm saying this to help you and your person help you prosper and do well. So this tenth is important because here's the way it works. So in that day, the presence of God was located in Jerusalem. And everything that happened in the economy of God happened to Israel through whatever they did with that temple. So if they kept the temple up and they kept giving the tithes, the tithes went to a real practical thing. It went to support the workers. It went to support the priests who would keep God's cause alive by preaching the word, keep God's cause alive by doing the sacrifices that were necessary to cover sin. But when they stopped with the tithes, the guys that were working said, man, I got to eat. So they leave the temple and they go out and start doing farming or some other business. And now the cause of God is going down the drain because nobody's there in the temple teaching and the people get corrupt. They start worshiping idols. And for, first thing you know, there's no presence. There's no awareness of Jesus at all or God in the place at all. And so that's what he's talking about. You're robbing me because the structure I've set up for my worship and for honoring me is gone. And it's just a question of actually of honor. See, what you did was you dishonored me. Giving is a matter of honoring God. First and foremost, honoring God. So let me just tell you a story here. So I've been from one end of the earth to the other. It's the same in every tribe, tongue, and nation. Isn't it a little suspicious to you? There's ministries doing all kinds of great things and benevolence all over the planet. But then there's Frodo, and he never goes away. The little church is planted in every tribe, tongue, and nation. And we will tell you over and over, you can even do this from a scientific point of view. They've just done study after study. The fastest way to get a people evangelized is to multiply churches in that place. So that means you have a pastor, and you've got some leaders, and you've got a community. And so you multiply those little communities of heaven. That's how nations get evangelized. Take every crusade you want, but it's, that's not how ultimately they get fixed. Nations become discipled through the multiplication of these because when the evangelist is gone, the church remains. And the church remains with its outreach and keeps going and going and going. And all through these centuries, we got 2,000 years of church history. Is it suspicious to you that whether you're in Russia or Iran or wherever country you are, there's always little communities of believers so these are the new temples. So when they give to their temple, the leadership, and they give, and they sow to it, what that does is that, that little place of piece of heaven prospers and grows. You see, but when you stop doing that, then the cause suffers because the thing begins to decrease and decline. God's tied its increase to finances, just like he's tied it to a lot of other things that are important, right? You see what I'm saying? So... And he likes it because he likes this whole thing of giving and receiving because he wants you to understand that your life doesn't consist of your possessions. And it's a question of honor. Are you for my cause first in your life? And that has to do with your attendance too. 
just setting aside a day. Isn't it suspicious that in 2,000 years people are still going to a meeting once a week, <laughs> a bigger gathering, and then smaller meetings, just like the early church, Solomon's colonnade of the church, and it doesn't stop. No matter what you do, no matter how you shape, it's always the same. So even your attendance is a matter of honor. You just come to worship the Most High God. That's just what I do. I set aside a part of my day, and every demon of hell knows that about you. I'll guarantee you, when you come to church, he checks his bag at the door, does not come in. Whatever's assaulting you, and you live in this environment of demons and angels and all the rest, and I tell you what, there's no safer place to be and no better place to do and invest your time and your money in the kingdom of God, in the corporate expression, then God puts it back on your own head. That's why it's so personal. And it doesn't change from Old Testament to New Testament. It's the same thing. So it's so important for us to understand, even for our welfare. The funny thing is, it's like you're robbing me, you know, this. But God's actually behind it going, you know what? <clears throat> then could I just say it another way if you didn't get that robbing part? <laughs> why don't you test me? And have a consistent life of giving and faithfulness to my cause and to who I am. Why don't you honor me first, no matter what it costs, and then guess what? I'll honor you. And my, I think it's so amazing when I look at this, I, I'm thinking, wow. He, he goes way over his way to overemphasize it. See if I won't throw open the floodgates of heaven. I like that. Pour out so much blessing you won't have enough room to store it. I'll, I'll prevent pests from destroying your crops and vines. Wow, what a deal. That's God's deal. I just think it's glorious. So there's tithes, which is really the first 10%. I laugh at people sometimes. They say, well, is it 10% out of the gross or out of the net? <laughs> just work it out for yourself. I got an opinion on it, but you can take your own opinion. Just do it with God experiment. Let it just do it. Step out and do something. Just keep growing. You know what? He's big enough to allow you to kind of step into this and warm up. But whatever you do, just keep making it month by month. Just move, move, move until you're at least to the 10% thing and you're giving. And the funny thing is we're going to find out is this giving doesn't sit still. It doesn't just have to do with money. This might be shocking to you, but notice in this whole thing, this whole dynamic, when you give, it's not only helping you in your finances, but in every other area of your life too. The whole picture is one of prosperity and the goodness of God dwelling with you. All right. So there's tithes. There's offerings, which are things that are given in addition to the tenth, just for special things, special, special uh, causes, things that you see. Maybe you want to help take care of a homeless person or whatever. I, I'm just so blessed. I have this guy this morning I was meeting, and uh, uh, his butt name is Bud Waithman. And for years and years, now over a decade, he goes to our little place here. He goes into Costco. And he goes and he makes sandwiches for 200 people. And sometimes it's only him and his wife. And he does it every single Sunday. And he's a CPA and an accountant. It's an amazing thing. And he just gives that offering to the Lord every single weekend of his life. He goes and takes those sandwiches at Santa Ana and feeds them. He is one of my glorious heroes. How do you know that CPAs are a little busy? He even does it right in the middle of busy season, night and day. He never misses that divine appointment. When I looked at him, you know, I'm looking at him thinking, wow. Wow, that's hard. No trace of hard on him. He's the most smiley, happy thing. It's the happiest thing he does all week. He's happy. There's no pain here because he's giving along with the cheerful God. He's giving to these people. He knows that's what he gets to do for the most high God. He gets to do that. And he gets to do it every Sunday. By the way, you can join him if you like. But he gets up there and most people join him for like two weeks and they stop because, you know, it's like a bunch of people around. It's, isn't it amazing how we get our visions of how to help the weak or the poor, you know? <laughs> <laughs> we knew that going in, you know. Okay. You know, they go in there and, yeah, they're full of joy one day, and then they see how hard it is and how it's not so, like, romantic at all, you know. It, it really is giving. It really is service. It really is work, you know. And so we just, you know, and then they go, and we just keep going week after week, step after step. But there's joy in it. That consistency is where you find the joy. You, you just got to keep moving along till the joy overtakes you. Then we've got these things I call radical offerings, extravagant offerings, or we can call them painful offerings. <laughs> it's where you go beyond the tenth and, and beyond even offerings, and God leads you to do this, uh, the absolute amazing. He to, leads you to do the impossible. He leads you to do something so extravagant you don't even want to tell anybody about it. So extravagant, it scares you half to death, right? Isn't it interesting? We see in the Bible this. How much did it cost David to build that temple in Jerusalem? You know what? Estimate or estimate that David 
gave one of these extravagant things to the temple. He was building this temple because the temple was about God. It was about God and Israel. It was about God and the earth. He gave $21 billion worth of gold and, and silver and all the rest. So they estimate $21 billion. I think that would classify as an extravagant gift, wouldn't it? And I don't think he suffered for giving it. He seemed to have plenty of money. $21 billion. And Solomon, he was only supposed to sacrifice one animal for his coronation, but he sacrifices 1,000. And when God said, hey, you know what, ask me for whatever you wish and I'll give it, you know. And he says, man, he could have asked for the world. He didn't even ask for money. He asked for wisdom. and said, you know, because you didn't ask, because that wasn't first and foremost on, on your mind, because walking with me was first and foremost in your mind, you know, I'm going to give you all the rest. And he made him the most wealthy person that probably has ever lived on the planet. That's Solomon. Extravagant giver. And we look at Jesus watching the rich putting their offering in the basket, you know, in the, in the temple. He's watching them, you know. Isn't that interesting that even Jesus is sitting down there watching the offering? I mean, he's, he's watching it. I think that's interesting in itself. He's just watching. Hmm. And then he sees this wealthy people doing this, and he sees this widow come up and giving the, he said she gave two, she gave two mites, that's in the King James Version, and it was all she had. It was all she had to live in. And he knows it full well. And there's no record in there, no effort to, hey, wait a minute. You know, hey, hey, get some money out of the, uh, the box and give that to that woman because they had a little treasury box. And nope, didn't say a word. You know why? Because he understood the kingdom of God. She gave that. He'll take care of her. She was going to be okay. Matter of fact, what he did was he received it. He, he just thought that was a beautiful thing. You know Why? Because Jesus was the two mites. Jesus was going to be the extravagant gift that the Father would give. He saw that woman giving that, and he realized he was that woman. He was about to do the same. And he just smiled at her, and he knew what the result was. He knew he'd resurrect from the dead. He understood. He understood what happened with her. He was going to take care of her. You cannot outgive God. How about Abraham? sacrificing his son. Do you think God doesn't have extravagant giving in the Bible? My, my. How about God sending Jesus? We talked about that already. The most precious to, thing in the universe. And then there's this Mary of Bethany who people couldn't, explain, couldn't understand. She poured out all this anointing oil on him because in God's plan, here's the most marvelous thing. I don't know if you thought about that, but she anointed Jesus with oil Right? And it was expensive, expensive. Thousands and thousands of dollars just poured out on him. And the disciples are looking, they're all huffy puffy. We could have done that for the poor. But he said, no, leave her alone. She's anointed me for my burial. See, when Jesus died, there wasn't enough time to, to do the normal anointing procedures. They had to hurry, get him in the tomb. And that's what Sunday morning was all about, when they were going to come, right, and uh, uh, anoint Jesus with oil. They were going to do the, the things they couldn't do after he's crucified. So she did it beforehand. And he said, you know what he said? This is what God thinks about generosity. What is, she has done will be known, will be taught on every tribe, tongue, and nation. Here I am in Laguna Niguel, California, teaching on this woman. And Jesus said that's exactly what was going to happen. She would be remembered. Why? For her generosity. That's how heaven values generosity. She'll be remembered through all these eons of time. She couldn't imagine what it would look like. She knows in heaven now, but she's honored and preached on, just like I'm doing right now. And Jesus said that's exactly what would happen because she was a giver, just like God's a giver. So let me just say something here. <clears throat> Back to 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 11. I want to read these verses again, and uh, we'll try to bring this to a close here. Remember this. Verses 6 to 11. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able, now listen to this, to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, is that, that enough alls for you? You will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous in every occasion. And through your, us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. What an amazing thing. So we can sow and then receive multiplication in every area of our life. 
And this multiplication factor we see in verses 6, 8, 10, and 11, right? Here's verse 6. Uh, reap generously. Verse 6. Look at verse 8. Verse 8. God is able to bless you abundantly so that all things at all times having all that you need. Look at verse 10. <clears throat> Increase your store of seed and enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Verse 11. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. Did you, say, did you see that enriched in every way? So this giving thing turns out that when you have a life of generosity with your finances, guess what? It comes down in other areas of your life that aren't financial at all. It's the whole package. You're generous with your life, and God's generous with you in every area. What good does it do to have a bag of money and something else is suffering, like a marriage or a family or a sickness or whatever? You understand? God wants to enrich you in how many different ways? I, I think he said in every way. Every way. Wow, what a promise. You see the promises behind this? And what's more, we can sow and then receive multiplication in every area of our life. Many times I ask God how I can sow toward a particular need in addition to my financial giving. So what happens is when you begin to become generous financially, you begin to be generous in other ways. And it's so, so important. So when I sow forgiveness, I receive forgiveness. What? Forgive and you'll be forgiven, right? When I sow worship, I reap God's presence. So I want to be giver and all kinds. So like when I come here, how do you know, like sometimes I just, like you, I just barely get here. I just, <laughs> what a week. What a night. You know, I just come in here. I don't even go if God's within a million miles of here. I'm just telling you a little secret here. So I have to worship. So I stand at worship, and I might be faking it like for the first three songs. I'm just singing it, but <laughs> I ain't feeling nothing. And I'm trying to feel grateful, but I don't feel grateful. I'm trying to feel happy, but I don't feel happy, you know. But, you know, somewhere along that third song, as I so worship, I get the presence. So I'm somewhat of an addict for God's presence because he makes me feel better, more confident, right? So when I so worship songs, I receive back. I, that, I can't understand. I, I watch people sometimes. And I wonder, why are you just sitting there in your seat like you don't even, what's the matter with you? Well, God, it's probably because you haven't discovered the presence. His presence is lovely. His presence makes everything right. You feel good. You feel right. So that's why I sow and worship. I worship in faith, but then the feeling catches up with me. Sometimes the feeling's there in 10 seconds. Sometimes it takes a little longer, but I know if I'll just sow and worship. After all, he's worthy. Well, no matter what I feel about anything, he's worthy of my worship, right? That's why you give your time. It's the worship that counts. Hey, I pledge allegiance to Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's why I'm here. I pledge allegiance. And all those other demons and things that want my allegiance, you can't have it. I pledge my allegiance and I renew my pledge. Man, I'll tell you what, some people will fight you to the death about the Pledge of Allegiance in schools. You know, and that's important. We, why we want it for our country and everything. But what about Pledge of Allegiance to Jesus? That's why you come to church. I pledge allegiance to Jesus. <laughs> because he's valuable. He's important. When I so worship, I receive his presence. When I so prayers, I see answers. When I pray for others, they pray for me. Now, if you believe in prayer, that's highly significant. If you don't believe prayer does anything, then you don't care. But I love people praying for me. When I pray for others, they pray for me. When I'm selfless, friendly, and giving toward others, guess what I reap? Relationships. Some people that are lousy at relationships have no idea. They're selfish. They're kind of within themselves and they're afraid. But to make friends, you've got to be selfless. You've got to be nice to people. You have to be friendly and giving toward others. Not giving to have a friend. Just be selfless toward them. Friendship will work its way out. But if you, like, latch onto somebody, be my friend, you know, and start doing all this <laughs> sacrifice, and you're doing all this, because, but you just want whatever they have or whatever they are, or whatever. I mean, people go, ooh, well, I appreciate the gift, but, like, you don't have to do that. No, 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 really, you don't have to do Because <laughs> they can feel the underlying motive. Like, be selfless. And that person, it's another relationship in for them, but don't worry about it. Just keep being generous and selfless to other people. God will find you friends and neighbors, everything. Just sow generosity. Be nice to everybody. Rich or poor or in between, and God will find friends. You will find relationships. Last thing. After sowing, it's important to expect and watch for multiplication. You can water the seed you sowed by expecting and praying for progress. 
I want to show you this passage, which is so meaningful to me, and it's the way spiritual things work because we live in such a push-button society, you know? And, it, and so when I even talking about giving, I'm talking about the long haul. I'm not talking about, I mean, it's happened to me where I've put some money in and gulped real hard and sweated and everything, and all of a sudden, like the next day, boom, but then there's sometimes been, I've done that, and it's been months and years even that I saw the return. So this is not push button. This is more like this. And I just want to read it from Mark chapter 4, verse 26 to 29. This is what the kingdom of God is like. Dun, da, da, da. A man scatters seed on the ground, like we've been saying, night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. It's a mystery sometimes how God does this. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Now I want you to notice this. The soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel. So in our miracles that we receive... Sometimes as we're receiving, we're watching God do things, sometimes there's just a little bit of movement. Whenever I see movement in my problems, I go, thank you, Jesus. Come on. More. Famous vineyard prayer. More. More. I see just a little bit. More. You can do that with every area of your life. More. More. And boy, I tell you, you can do it confidently when you know you've sowed properly because it's, something happens in the soil when you sow. More, Lord. More. More. No matter how you sow, there's all dimensions of sowing. There's the financial sowing, but there's other sowing that we just mentioned and all kinds of sowing, but watch for the multiplication. And so what I do is I just look for more. Many people give up and don't see the answer when it comes because they're not watching because it might take a while. More importantly, they don't see the progress in their own life. And I tell you, God is so good about this, he'll just give you a little progress. And when you see that little progress, that little thing coming out of the ground, you go, whoa, there it is. There's the blessing. Doesn't look like much to me. Well, that's going to be a full lawn pretty soon. Oh, it's just a tiny fish. No, no, it's growing. It's going to be a whale. Just watch. So you just keep praying and praying because that's the way it does. The kingdom has this way of growing. We lose so much blessing because we don't see the growth. We don't, we're not patient enough to watch the long haul of a person's life, right? So the Bible says very clearly, clearly don't get weary. You'll reap at the proper time. Matter of fact, we just finished with this. Let's just read Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 to 10. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit, he will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. So let's just keep being diligent to sow. We won't become weary. We might be, don't become weary in doing good because you know it's the right thing. In the proper time, you'll reap the harvest and whatever. And I just feel like the Holy Spirit's prompting me here. Certainly, we're talking about money, but I just want to just say again, remember that passage where it says, enriched in every way? I just think all forms of generosity and giving have this way of blessing you, and sometimes it'll show up in your money, sometimes it'll show up in a healing, sometimes it'll show up in a friend, sometimes it'll show up in a relationship that forms. God's generous in every, you'll be enriched in every way. We're faithful with our money, we're faithful to sow in other areas that God says we want to be generous to everybody. And so I just want to walk around as a happy, generous person. There's nothing more lovely in the universe than a happy, generous person. Nothing can keep them down. Even when they get lost, they know they're going to get gained. Even when things are stolen, you know what? God's going to feel that because he said, yeah, I'm going to prevent the pest. So if that pest came and was permitted to steal that, I'm going to you know what I say? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get double back. So I lost that part, but you know what? I'm going to be like Job. I'm going to get double back from my trouble. There must be something good that's going to come out of this. You cannot defeat a church like this. You cannot defeat a person like this. You rise out of the ashes, and as you grow in this day by day and week by week and month by month, you get stronger and stronger until somewhere in your life you go, well, you know what? <clears throat> the lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. What about tomorrow? Well, they're going to fall to me in pleasant places tomorrow too. Well, that thing that you did over there, it's not looking too good. Yeah. MLA. What's MLA? Momentary light affliction. Momentary light affliction. <laughs> I tell you, you know, there's always something waiting around, I suppose, to knock my block off. But somehow or another, I just think through the years, Janice and I have gotten a lot tougher. 
And it's just tough here because of the blessing, because of the favor, because of the joy of the Lord. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He knew there was something on the other side. For all that I'm talking and the hearing of my voice, as a born-again believer, there's always some more blessing on the other side for you. Just learn to be generous. Amen? Let's all stand. You know, uh, you guys that are coming up for the worship, could, could you, I just got this ring in my ears. You are good in the morning. <laughs> that song blesses me so much. So what we did last night, which was really powerful, is I saw what I just said, invited people to come up, which I always do, because I, I want you to have an encounter with God over the message. And some people I could see were, were, were just up here and they were just sort of losing baggage and fear and stuff and making just a new connection to the Lord in this area. Some of you have already connected this way and those people were calling down heaven on their stuff because <laughs> they know they sow. They just haven't seen the blessing yet. So they're calling down the blessing on their stuff, you know. Other people were going, well, I think I need to rework the plumbing a little bit to my apartment. <laughs> I just need to do some things because down underneath the plumbing, I, there's some things I haven't taken care of. I've just been too afraid. But let me just say, God's so generous with regard to this. This is a message of opportunity. And also, God's not wooden. He'll work with you. So if 10% 10, 10 freaks you out, just give a little bit more every time. Just learn. Let him prove himself to you, you know. If you want to just jump into it, just do, because I don't think giving is comfortable at any point in time, you know, some, for, for sometimes, but it's more comfortable for me now than before, but there have been times it's been very uncomfortable, but whether it's just a little or a lot, just get in the cycle, excel in the grace of giving. You won't ever regret it. You won't ever regret it. So some of you may have to work on that a little bit and just ask God, God, please give me faith for this and show me what to do now. Others of you have seed in the ground and you're calling down fire on it. <laughs> the blessing in your life. Things that have been left undone. You just need to see God. Come on, God. Come. That's what you said. You could take those promises of Malachi, dust them off and say, you know what? The best, be gone. <laughs> be repaired. And on the other side of it, you know, good measure, pressed down, shaken together. I like those things. I just concentrate on the floodgates of heaven and the good measure. How about you? Some of you might want to do that. But there's some important business in response to a message like this. So if this is ministered to you in any way, just give God a little extra time. Remember that word, give? Just give a moment to talk to your heart. Give him a moment to get some prayer out of your mouth. And just do some business. You don't even have to take 30 minutes or 10 minutes. Just take two minutes, three minutes, five minutes. Just, just respond some way. And if you're already in this place and flow, you know, then you're good. But I don't know a single person here that doesn't have something that needs to be tied up, some loose end that God needs to deal with. But it's a family matter, whatever. So this is an atmosphere where I believe we've opened the heavens a little bit, spoke some truth, and amazing offers are on the table. So if you feel that, why don't you just come up to the front real quick, wherever you are do some business with the Lord. We're, we're, in the, uh, we're in the store. We're in Jesus' store doing business with God here. So I'm just going to pray a general prayer for all of you to come up. And if you don't want to come up, don't come up. Just pray from your seat. It's okay to do that. reason why I say people come up is not just to prove to myself that it was a good message or not. <laughs> it's to help you to respond. But you can do it from your seat. It's the heart that counts, not your legs. So I'm just going to pray a gentle prayer and we'll stop, okay? And as they worship, just let the worship feed your prayer, your declaration. Can you do that good thing? Okay, good. So Lord, I declare the floodgates of heaven over this place. I declare a happy, generous house and a happy, generous year 2020. I declare goodness in the land of the living because otherwise we'd despair. I declare over family matters. I declare over financial matters. Everything that counts. Everything we've been sowing toward. Lord, I declare, Lord, that we are going to make changes where we need to make changes. And where we've already made changes, I declare the grace of God. I pray excelling in the grace of giving over this whole congregation for many years to come. 
I declare whole family lines and generations will be changed. And I pray the curse of poverty, the curse of loss will be broken once and for all over whole family lines and families in Jesus' name. And I pray opportunity would open up like a flower. And by the way, can I just say this? You're not a victim. Stop being a victim. You're not a victim. Oh my gosh, people walk around like victims. You're not a victim. You got one penny to give to God. You're not a victim. You got one prayer to offer. You're not a victim. You have something to give. Don't walk around like you have nothing. You have everything. It's all locked up inside. The answer is not just way out there somewhere. It's in here and in the partnership with God Almighty. Don't be a victim anymore. Oh, I just can't get that job. No, I just, just once you set the economy, God, in motion, it's water that thing and expect it and keep on sowing until God brings the reaping and shows you what to do. God, do that. I don't care how many times, where you've been, I declare that over this place. I pray you cut through the heart, Lord. I pray you would cause encouragement and fire like we've never experienced before. I pray, God, good measure, pressed down, shaken together over this church in every area of life, in our marriages, in our families. Lord, in whatever we're doing, I break the spirit of alcoholism. I break the spirit of addiction of anybody in this room. I break it off of you. May God have his grace on you in every way. In Jesus' name. We pray for you this morning. I pray, God, you would have a, there would be a breakthrough in the soul that leads to a breakthrough in the body, the mind, and the families. In Jesus' name. I pray you would turn loose whole families that have been under bondage for years. In Jesus' name. I will sing of your goodness. I will sing of your love. Though the sea.